because you're jumping back into the gap. I went to coach. It's either side. Excited today on the basketball podcast to have Terry Fowler with us. Coach Fowler is the head coach of the women's team at the University of South Alabama. In his sixth year there and 20th overall as a head coach, was previously at North Alabama, NCAA Division II. And this year, Coach, you're having a great year at South Alabama. 16-3, and three, you've won at Alabama. And just to give people perspective, I mean, your program, that's not unique. You beat North Carolina last year and won there. And super excited to have you on the podcast for a lot of reasons. You know, number one, you're a great coach and great person, but you're also a member of Basketball Immersion. So I'm excited to dive into some of these topics with you. Hey, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, tremendous success and done a great job with the program there at South Alabama. But let's talk a little bit about the realities in coaching nowadays. And that's the fact that you can't keep doing things the same way you've done them in the past because the game's changed, players have changed, things have changed. I think you're a great representative of this and a person with a very open mind to try new things and challenge themselves, even though you've been in coaching for over 25 years. Can you talk a little bit about some of the changes that you've gone through as a coach? Yeah, and, you know, just to get a little bit of background, I'm really, I would consider myself a Don Meyer disciple. I really worked his camps, did a lot of that. So, you know, and, and I know he was a, a coach who adapted to the game, you know, the shot clock, the three-point line, different things like that. But, you know, I'm a defensive-minded coach, and we just really need to do some different things offensively. And, you know, one of the things that kind of happened was we had a foreign trip to uh, Montreal in the summer of 17. And so, you know, you get to 10 days of NCAA practices. And so we had to practice with the FIBA rules, 24-second shot clock, you know, the reset of 14 on an offensive rebound. And, man, we just speeded up our practices. It did so much for us. We saw we had so many more possessions. And we never practiced with a 30-second shot clock again. And it really changed how I thought about the game, playing that. I really enjoyed it. Well, how cool is that? And, and first of all, there's no better – person to learn from in coaching than Don Meyer. And I grew up watching everything that he produced as a DVD and I've attended his academy and I was fortunate to have him up for a coaching clinic as well. And, you know, so many things, and I'm sure that relates for you as well. So many things that he said or the way he said things, especially his terminology, still resonate with what we do as coaches. And especially when we're talking about, you know, skill-based coaching. So is there still a big influence in terms of what you do? Yes, it is. I mean, you know, still really, you know, hit myself repeating some of the things he said. And, you know, like you say, you always go back to your notebooks when you work as camps. And, you know, like, like you said, you got all the DVDs and everything. And so still a lot of that. But the main thing is really have an open mind to try to change and do some different things. And for me, that's really, really difficult because things. And for me, that's really, really difficult because I'm a... Uh, conservative person by nature, kind of a creature of habit. And so the, the changes we've made within our program the last few years have been some uh, uh, big changes for me more so than anybody else. Well, and again, I don't want to make this about, obviously you changed to something aligns with my philosophy to say that I admire you. Because if you had changed in any way as a coach and gone through something that said, hey, I have a new belief or a new way of doing things, I would admire that because I admire that in so many coaches and so many people, so many leaders in general that, you know, everything changes and we can't do the same thing and expect, you know, the same results as we move through our careers and our paths. So I admire what you've done, coach. And let's dive into the FIBA rule concept that changed. So especially the pace of the game. Are you finding now because of you changed the way you guys practice that you're playing at a faster pace on offense as well? Yes, without a guy addition, you know, we're playing faster in the half court as well. And so, you know, another thing we kind of adapted and, and we did it a lot this summer was the three on three FIBA game. And that's really increased our pace of play. But more importantly, that is it's increased our ability to make some better decisions on the floor as well. So uh, those things I'm excited about moving forward as well. And we're going to get into what you're excited about because I think this has stimulated even more ideas for you, especially when you get to your off season. But the three on three, the Phoebe game. So let's explain to coaches what you're doing. Like, let's get into that a little bit. Are you, they have a shot clock in this, the way you play yes. the three on three? And are they playing yes. half court, full court? What do you do? We're playing half court and we're playing with the shot clock. How long is the shot clock you're playing with in the three on three? We're playing with the 14 second shot clock. Yep. And we play for 10 minutes. Or the first team to 21, 
and it's twos and ones. And like I say, it's just, get, and it's twos and ones. And like I say, it's just get it out, you know, rebound, pass it out behind the three point line, then have to go on top. And so you just, you have to transition from offense to defense and defense to offense quickly. And what is also done for us is forced our players to make a second action. So, you know, a lot of times people pass and stand. So now it's pass, it's cut. You know, if you cut inside the three-point line, we want our kids to then get back out to the other side, outside the three-point line. It just creates the defense to have to make a lot of adjustments. Are they going to go help? Well, we space the floor some more by getting back outside the three-point line. We get a penetrate and then drive and pitch it out, and we get an open three. So it's just created a lot of pace and a lot of movement. Again, decision-making. Well, no time for your players to worry about mistakes either. They just have to move on quickly. And that's a byproduct of kind of that three-on-three style that you're playing. Is that, That's a byproduct of kind of that three-on-three style that you're playing is that, that you don't have time to ever drop your head or, you know, talk to one of your teammates about a mistake in a bad way. It's just you got to play. You got to move on. You got to play in the present, right? Exactly. You know, like I say, you could turn it over well. You got to get ready to start quickly and play defense. So it's been great. Yeah. And that's the other part that people don't understand. Like pace has as much to do with your defense and uh, as it does your offense. And those things come together in the three and three FIBA, which is great. And the other part that I like that what you said is how your players are getting better and faster at respacing. And when I've coached internationally overseas, that's the one part that I find remarkable is how quickly they move from basket to weak side. And it just puts so much pressure on our defense to be able to get out and cover more space. And we've tried to add that to our players this year, and it hasn't been a fast uh, process. So this three-on-three idea is uh, something that we might steal to to be able to do that too. Yeah, it's one of those things where, and it's out of it, it is. Let's say we've got two on O, we're on the left wing, and we've got a kid in the right corner. Well, we penetrate pitch to the right corner, but instead of just standing and letting that player just catch and shoot, we're breaking back out and forcing a pass back to the original passer outside on the wing. And, you know, now they play from there. So it's just been great to have the consecutive actions. And I think those are the hardest thing to guard. Yeah. And coach, in the three on three, are they running sequences that you guys would use within your offense? Are you emphasizing certain things? Like today you have to run a ball screen, today you have to run a down screen, or is it just freedom within the three on three? Yeah, this summer we did some, it was just freedom because we kind of introduced it to them. As we've done it a little bit more, sometimes we've started with a ball screen. Because that way now we get to work on our pick and roll defense as well. And so, you know, you're trying to do two things at one time and coach both sides of the ball. And and I think those major adjustments for me as a coach, we really hadn't done that a lot. We really focused on, all right, this segment is offense, this segment is defense. And so now we're trying to do it all at one time. Well, and that's what I say to a lot of coaches. Like that's one of their hardest adjustments to going to a game's approach is, is that now you do have to be able to coach both sides of the ball. Fortunately, with your experiences in coaching, I don't think it's a difficult adjustment. I don't think it's a difficult adjustment for most people. But, you know, it's just that ability to be able to not watch the ball, but also to be aware of not just what the offense is doing, but what the defense is doing too. So I'm sure you're fine there, coach. But the other part that you said is basically you're now in what we call constraints, which is that you're introducing something, whether it be a ball screen or whether it be, you know, a stagger screen, double screen, whatever it is within your three and three, four and four, that is forcing your team to work on offense versus defensive situations that you would see in the game, either that you run or that you would see from an opponent. And it really isn't complicated that you run or that you would see from an opponent. And it really isn't complicated, is it? It's that simple. This concept of a game's approach is just to do that. And, you know, it'd be interesting as you guys move forward. But let's talk about practice, Coach. What are some of the other things? So you talked about a short shot clock in practice. What are some other things that have translated for you guys in terms of this new philosophy? Yeah, well, you know, we used to come out and you do your basic drills, all your on-air, where it's stationary ball handling, whether it's – um just kind of going up and down the floor with your, you know, you did your three-man weave and all those types of things. You know, we've kind of gotten away from that. Instead of stationary ball handling, we, we may come out and just have one-on-one trying to steal the ball from the other player, you know, just working on those type of actions because that's the ball handling you're going to have in the game. One of the things we do now is we'll come right out after our stretch 
we'll maybe have some guard post shooting just to kind of get us going. And, and then we're going three on three, to five on three, to five on five, to a minute and a half or two minute game. And our kids like that. They come right out and we're playing basketball. And so, um, you know, those things have picked up the pace of practice, created a little more energy. And, you know, typically before I started doing this, we wouldn't go, you know, live in the full court probably to the, you know, the second hour of practice, you know. And, you know, after you've done all your defensive half court stuff, your offensive half court, then we would be, all right, we're going to work on full court. Now we're playing right away. And so the kids, they love that. I had an NBA coach say this to me in the sense that some of the ideas that I shared with him, he said the biggest translation was that they remove the fluff. They remove the fluff. And that sounds exactly what you're doing. You're getting right to the point and you're connecting ideas. And that's a question too, coach, with the three on three, how have you been able to connect that back to the five on five for your players? Well, one of, you know, certain things you do, you know, we don't dictate what the defense is doing, you know, and, and so then we kind of, let's say you got a baseline stagger, you know, you're running something there, and but that's how we can play three on three. And so now that's part of our five on five offense. And so now we get that actual flow of that and it just carries over to now we five on five and we've seen it in the three on three several times. And now we can just carry it over to five on five and we can make whatever job. Did they trail it? Did they go under the last screen? Did they switch it? And so we don't have to dictate as much because we see it live. And that's great. And that's a great connection to be able to understand is that your players immediately get what you're doing within the context that they have to perform it within the game. And that's so important for players. And, and you mentioned this already, but I wonder that you've had, since you've gone through this change, how have they enjoyed it? It's funny you ask that because just um, Saturday, we were playing, and after the game, we had a press conference, and I was talking to one of the players. Just, I felt like we didn't have energy at practice. We didn't do anything. We weren't as fired up at the beginning of practice. And it's funny because the last two practices, we had kind of went back to some of the fluff because, you know, it's one of those things where as a coach, you feel like we need to work on these things. So we went back to the fluff, and my player said to me, Coach, it was just kind of tough to get our energy up because we were just back doing some of the simple things. You know, now to me, it's like, I hear you, but the simple things are what win the game. And so that's interesting. So I know we go back to practice today. You know, we'll get back to getting into that five-on-five, you know, three-on-three to five-on-five action because that is, that is what created the energy, the, the fact that we were playing, you know. So I'm excited Coach, about that. Yeah, it's a great point. And I need to, and I'm going to bring this to light in a blog eventually here when I get a chance to get it done. But there's nothing wrong with going back to the drills. There's nothing wrong with going back to what I would call maybe the mindless drills, even more than the fluff drills. Is They're the repetitive block drills. Or they're even random drills that maybe, you know, have less variability than the game or whatever they are to help you get your coaching points across. Because mm -hmm. sometimes your players need those reminders. Sometimes they need that reemphasis. And that's cool. I think the difference in terms of what we're talking about is we're just not going to spend every practice on those. And we're not going to spend every moment on those because we know that our one, our players don't need those. And the things that don't engage our players mentally are the things that cause boredom in practice. They cause certainly things that don't transfer to the game. And that's really cool that your players have noticed that as well. But, you know, it doesn't mean that you'll only have to try and run practice to please your players. I'm guessing it's that as well, but, you know, it doesn't mean that you'll only have to try and run practice to please your players. I'm guessing that's the same for you. No matter what you do, yeah. hey, players would rather play games, right? Exactly. Exactly. And so, like I said, for me, for her just had a conversation that, you know, she picked that up. Well, it was great, you know, to hear from, and this is one of our young players. This is a sophomore that's talking to me. And so I was like, okay, interesting point. But, you know, like I said, I, hey, we have to go back to some of those things. But I know, you know, we will get back to starting right into some play action and then coach out of that. And I'm sure our energy level will pick up and it'll be a lot, of, lot more fun for them. And as a coach, you want to see that energy and you want to see us get after it, especially after we had that type of energy for a while. To see it drop, you know, was kind of 
scary for me because I was like, man, we really getting bored. Are we taking this for granted? Some of the success that we're having, but really it was just, she was, you know, really want to get back to getting after it and playing. And, and this is the most competitive team I've ever coached. And um, so that's part of their process as well. Well, and it's interesting to get, I've asked other coaches this, so I'm curious what the answer is here. Have you had to explain to your players, say, especially your freshmen, how you're practicing and why you're practicing this way? Because a lot of players that come from very traditional type of practices don't really know. And I know I get this within my program. So my newcomers are like, what is this all about? Like, this is not what I've ever done at practice. Do you have to explain it somewhat? We did early. And I thought one of the things that they picked up a little bit was we weren't practicing as long and we were getting right into it. They were playing basketball. And so I think those were the things that once we explained it a little bit right away, hey, this is what we want to do. So if we're going to do these things, we've got to be able to have this pace. We need to have this energy. We need to have this energy level. And from that point on, you know, they've been pretty receptive to it. They know they're going to get in here and we're going to get some games in and we're going to go live a lot, you know, whether it's three on three, four on four or five on five, they, they come in, they're ready to participate. Well, it's great because the other connection that you're seeing is that like your players have a real good feel for what a good practice is and what is not because it more aligns with what a good game would be. Like win or lose, they would have a really good impression of how well you played as a team because you're practicing in a more similar way to how you play. So those two things connect. And I see that you're finding that even with a sophomore player, that she understands what a good practice is. And that eliminates for you a lot of the messages that you normally have to dictate to players, whereas you can open the door to more open communication as well. And I don't know in terms of your program, but are your players empowered within your program to be elders empowered within your program? To be able that, to see and share? That is the entire philosophy behind what we try to do. Is empower our kids on and off the floor that the decisions you make are, you know, what's going to be to your success or not have a success. So we definitely try to empower them to do that. This is their team. You know, it's your practice, you know. And, I, you know, I probably can sit and say, we probably hadn't had two handfuls of just, you know, man, what happened today? You know, we've had our moments. But we kind of adapted this from uh, Mike Neighbors at Arkansas. We give our kids three timeouts and let them talk about it when it's kind of going, getting off the rails. And, and they try to correct it and, and get back out and finish strong. Can you talk about that a little bit? Can you explain a little bit more deeply what you mean by they have some timeouts in practice? Yeah. So, you know, we, we just say, listen, you, you guys have three timeouts. They're not to take before we do some running or do some levels not there. The focus and concentration, well, you'll see our leaders ask for a timeout. And they, they'll huddle up and they'll come out and we give them, you know, like a game timeout. We give them a minute and a half and they can come out and try to correct the practices and let's do it and compete. And so we give three of those a day. And I tell you, you know, early in the year we were taking three. I mean, but now, you know, a matter of fact, we just took one the other day, and that's the first one in a long while. So, again, it's their team. We're just there to guide them. That's the way we kind of approach to uh, our team and our program. Well, that's well said. That player-led approach is really refreshing, but it's also, isn't it much easier for you as a coach, in a sense? Like, it's harder somewhat to coach practice because you have to be engaged in everything, and it's not as isolated in terms of what you're focusing on. But in terms of actually coaching your players, it just makes it a much more refreshing, easier experience because your players, and I find I have to do less of that, hey, you know, come on, let's practice. Oh, come on, let's, you know, let's motivate, let's motivate. You don't have to do that. I mean, it's a player-led program. So motivation is on them, you know, the quality of the practice is on them because they have, in your situation, they have timeouts, different things like that. Are you finding that as well? I love that. You know, when we were in North Alabama, I tell you, we had a run going our last three years. And I can tell you for the last two years, we weren't coaching it. We had great players that were running it. Coach, we got this. And, you know, hey, I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to take a time out. And your senior, you know, we had a point guard that's unreal and she's actually coaching right now I'm at Butler University. She said, coach, I got it. And you would see her call the huddle and get, and she would say exactly what I was about to say. 
And I was like, okay, we got something here. We got a chance to be really special. And, you know, that team went on to the NCAA tournament and had a great season. And so when we took the job, it's going to kind of create that culture. We didn't have that in the last two years. It's kind of been like that. I mean, last year we had five seniors on the team, and they basically ran the program. I mean, they set the tone in practice. They did it. Now we're a young team again with nine of our 14 players, our freshmen or sophomores. So we've had to step in a little bit more, but you're seeing our players starting to take the reins. And, and so that's what you hope for as a coach. Uh, it's tremendous. And, you know, as I said, it makes it easier for you. But I get asked by young coaches a lot about this type of philosophy and this type of style because they find that whether it's, a, you know, they're running the JV team and the varsity coach does things different or it's an administrator or someone or a parent, that often the people that are around them don't understand what they're doing and don't think it's coaching. And I'm not sure if you face similar situations where you have to, have to explain your philosophy to certain people, administrators, et cetera. But do you have any insights on that a little bit in terms of, do you have any insights on that a little bit in terms of moving to this philosophy relatively recently about how much it changes people's perspective on what you're doing? Because again, like someone would say, oh, you just roll out the balls. Well, no, we're not just scrimmaging. We're stopping, we're starting we're correcting, we're doing the same thing you would do in any other practice. Right. And the key factor, Coach, is this. Our staff was all in on this. Like I said, I've kind of been following it and looking at it and thinking it for, you know, about a year and a half or or whatever. And I said, hey, I gave some information to my staff. And what do you guys think? They're like, we're all for it. And so now our staff's all aligned. You know, and, and, and fortunate for me, you know, I've got one of my assistants who's been with me for 17, 18 years, you know, so we can finish each other's sentences. And Dan Prelso, I mean, he, he's just, he's an offensive minded, so he's all into whatever we need to do offensively. Then I've got a great group of you offensively. Then I've got a great group of young ladies that really recruit, but they're young, really good coaches. And they were all in and they were excited to try to learn something new. Yolisha Jackson's done a great job for us and Rachel Travis. So once our staff is all aligned, now it's as easy. So now anyone who comes to our practice can talk to one of our coaches and they can say, hey, look, we're just trying to, you know, play games <laughs> in practice. But we are coaching and we have talked about certain things. You know, and I had any comments from administrators or anything like that I will say this there's one game where we just weren't ready to play and we had a good lead and then we let it slide you know and everybody now administration is talking why didn't you take a time out I said it's because our players they need to figure out how to dig their way out of that situation so they were able to do it and we had to finish the game strong but it was their job you know it's, it's their program energy and we want them to have ownership and when they do that then things get corrected a lot easier than coaches yelling and screaming, which I'm not a yeller or screamer uh, to begin with. Well, it's great insights. And the timeout thing is something that's really interesting. Like I, I mean, FIBA is different. Obviously we were limited. We only have two in the first and we have three in the second and you lose one if you don't use it before the under two minute mark. So I am a saver of timeouts and use them only when necessary and we almost always get to the last two minutes of the game with two timeouts left because everything is a figure it out. Now we have quarters and you guys play quarters too. So the NSA men's game would be different in that sense. But I have just noticed in watching Synergy and I try and look at last two minutes anywhere in the world where games are close. And I am so shocked when I watch NCAA games, how many NCAA games end with coaches without any timeouts to run play with coaches without any timeouts to run plays under two minutes. And I don't get that because there's so many TV timeouts as well that it's such an interesting concept. Are you finding even within games you're using less timeouts consistently so you have more for the end? Yes. Oh, no, no doubt. I mean, something has really got to go awry for me to use one in the first half. I'm just not. We've got to get to those media timeouts. you got to get to the end of the quarter. But like I said, my assistant, Dan Pressel, he says there's nothing wrong with taking timeouts home. And so (laughs) I couldn't agree more. Yeah. (laughs) So we're holding off to the end because you never know. (laughs) 
That's great. And I don't know with the changes to the women's game under one minute, you can advance the ball, right? That's how it's working now? That's correct. That's correct. Are you finding more and more teams are like more and more games are ending with shots rather than free throws if they're close at the end? Most or, definitely. Most yeah. definitely. Yeah. It's been quarters, you know, you got four opportunities to do something now. And, you know, being able to advance the ball is great. And, and, you know, and that's kind of a deal where you learn, you, you know, I'm watching the NBA or you're doing different things. I'm watching other college teams on the women's side. You know, are you taking the timeouts now? Are like 30 seconds left, are you advancing the ball? You know, or she to just play on and let's see. So those are things I'm trying to figure out, you know the two for ones at the end of the quarters. Those are things we're trying to kind of figure out and get better at. So I love it. That's great. And uh, I mean, again, some coaches are always resistant to new ideas and it's fine. Whatever rules you play, you have to find out how to manage them. But I just find generally, again, timeouts are for the end of the game and the way that we're both practicing allows our players to play through moments a little bit more. Like we came back down 17 in a fourth quarter last week to win a game in overtime, in a game in overtime. And we didn't use timeouts to do that. We, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, again, pace of the play and having been in those situations and understanding that you have time and also practicing in a way that we're always practicing the way the game's played. So our players don't get too rattled, I don't think, by those moments. So, right. Yeah. yeah, and I think the other thing is, like you're saying, if the more you can try to get some unstructured opportunities as well and that's something we've tried to do more of is hey let's get the ball up the floor those are the things that are hard to defend you know people understand and know your half court sets good coaches they know how to try to take those things away from you you need to try to get people in scramble situations you know four on three three on twos and you know those type of situations and, and create mismatches so that's been big for us is just try to play on well, let's get into that, Coach, because uh, two-side fast break. Let's talk a little bit about that break as well, right? Yes, that has been a big change for us this year as well. Traditionally, had you know, pushed the ball up the floor, but kind of went into Carolina actions, you know, reverse the ball and get into the stagger screen and chase, you know, play high-low basketball. Now we're spacing the floor, and, you know, the corners are the most difficult spots on the floor to defend to me. And especially when you're coming down in transition, you know, you've got that full back or your player just to protect the basket. They've got to make decisions. Do they go out and get those corner shooters or are they standing there for to defend the layup? And so it's been great for us because it's just created more spacing. And it's been tough for us to defend because we do defend with a full back whose job is to stay under the basket and not give up a layup. And, and so it's been tough for us, and we've had to make some adjustments on that as well. Dave Smart is one of the best of the best coaches in the world, and now you can learn from him with never-before-available access. Three all-access practices and one defensive coaching clinic are available at davesmartbasketball.com. What makes these all-access practice and clinic videos so unique? Dave Smart has won 12 national championships and has a winning percentage of 92%. Dave Smart's Force We Can defensive system is world-renowned and has never been shared in this way before. Dave Smart has a winning record in over 50 games versus NCAA Division I teams, having beaten Wichita State, Baylor, Wisconsin, and many others. Dave Smart is recognized by Jay Wright, Mick Cronin, Jay Triano, and many other top coaches in the world as one of the best minds in basketball. Learn from one of the greatest minds in the game who opened his with us from one of the most successful basketball programs in the world. Go to davesmartbasketball.com now to learn more and to purchase all four videos. Well, I want to get into that, too, because it talks about about how it's changed your perspective a little bit on transition defense. But for those that are thinking about this, basically a two-side fast break, there's no traditional trail spot per se. You're running to the corners and you're running to the 45. And you rim run a player still, Coach, I assume? Yes, yes. So you can still rim run a player, but it's just that you create more spacing. You create double gaps and you create opportunities to be able to get the ball 
again, immediately into either driving the 45 or getting that that extra pass to create two on ones in transition to be able to attack and and really into shot drive decision. So it's it's great stuff. But what traditionally happens is transition defenses recover down the middle. But against a two side break where you're running wide, transition defenses fences recover down the middle. But against a two side break where you're running wide, transition defenses kind of have to adapt because it's more dangerous on the wings than it is down the middle. So what we've found is that teams, not this year as much, but last year when we had much better guard play teams almost as we went through the year had to fan out and they left the middle the tunnel the traditional transition spot empty so we ended up driving it more to the rim late in the season than we did early early in the season we tended to play early and opposite and do stuff like that so are you finding teams are trying to approach it with different strategies to be able to stop you guys in transition no, the thing about it, it's a couple of teams. Some teams in my league that run it, so they probably having the same problems defensively. So they are getting out there to those wings and to the corners. And so, you know, what we also would do out of it is if our five player is trailing the play, they'll go right into a drag ball screen. So now we're trying to create the drive. You know, we need to take it down and kind of get to some and pitch it and then create that two-on-one on the weak side over there. So if they come out and get in the slot, slot position, you're 45, and then we can reverse to the corner and we got an open look. So you just got to get the ball changing from side to side. Well, I love that terminology and like early and opposite. And we've had some different coaches on here that have talked about some of that. And it just, again, the new way of playing, whatever it is for whatever your team does is all player driven. Like we're able to do this stuff because our players are more skilled. Can you talk a little bit about some of the skill development that's led to your players being able to be successful in, say, a two-side break or playing a little bit more free and open style? Yeah, I can tell you, we do a lot of things where we start in the slot area, or but in transition, hey, we want to drive that slot area. We want to drive it. So we want to attack that. So we do a lot of those type of drills where we start half court and just dribbling down in transition and give them different type moves to attack out of the slot because that's what's going to create help. And now we just got to find an open player, you know, whether it came from the same side corner or from the opposite corner. That's what we want to do. So those types of things. And one through four do those drills, okay? Now our fives don't really get into that, and that's something we'll probably work on during the off season. But one through, one through four, they do those type of drills. We do a lot of finishes around the basket, you know, wrong foot, wrong hand. You know, we've kind of gotten into this reverse pivot thing where everybody's got, you know, Villanova kind of had going and everybody's doing it now. One other thing that's been good for us, and we're starting to see it in games. Our kids are seeing, you know, we were doing it in practice and they weren't seeing it. And then a couple of possessions happen where we make a play. We're ready to, let's say, pass the ball to the corner or pass, and they weren't seeing it. And then a couple of possessions happen where we make a play we're ready to, let's say, pass the ball to the corner or pass to the 45, and they go out and deny it, and we get a late second cut. And some of those things that were just drilled and we were doing, they're now becoming, you know, they're showing their heads in games. And so our kids are like, ah. So when we go back and show film, we're like, what is that? And they'll say, oh, that's this. Oh, that, that's that drill. This that move. And so it, it's been fun to see it. Well, that's great because they're noticing the success. They're noticing the transfer. And that's, again, a common question is, how do I know it's working? How do I know it's transferring? And, you know, the the Villanova pivot, which we call a back pivot for coaches that are looking at our stuff. But that concept, how do you know it's working? Well, again, you see it in practice and you see it in game. That's really what transfer is. It's something that you're doing in practice. You're seeing them doing it. And the fact that your players, again, are noticing it, which then your players valuing practice, in the sense that it's helping them perform better in a game. And I think that's the biggest argument for this type of approach to coaching is that so many of the block drills and, you know, three man weave or whatever it may be, you can't connect that and say, that's what we worked on. That's what we worked on in practice. And that's in the game, you know, because probably not three manning weaving to a layup very often, are you? Right. No, (laughs) no. And you know, it is, even if you're coming down, because like I said, one of the drills we were doing, to just kind of get us back. All right, let's work on our passing. We've been getting a lot of transition and we need to throw over the top, the long pass. 
And so we just kind of did some of those, you know, on air. And let's do it. So now, but again, like you said, you've got to go back to some of those things. It doesn't mean we're going to spend the entire day on it. And then we can see it in a game or we see it in practice when it happens. And, and so those have been good things. Like I say, it is. They, they want to, and so those have been good things. Like I say, it is. They, they want to play and they want to see it. The transfer is the main thing is. And that's what's been good and for me to see some of our kids say, ah, that's what that is. Okay. Then I'm like, okay. And like I said, this is a young team, so I can only see what happens as we progress and they get older. That's great. And, Coach, I don't know if it's fair to say you're traditionally probably a defensive-minded coach. Is that fair? Yes. 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 So, and there's another important thing to kind of say is that, like, you're not giving up on defense by going to this approach. And I think sometimes that's misconstrued by coaches, too, is that, you know, you're just coaching both sides of the ball at the same time. And the same approach to offense is the same way we would do defense is that we may go into a drill, say a four on four drill saying this is we're working on defense, but really it becomes both. And can you talk a little bit about how this is married with your defensive mindset? Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about how this is married with your defensive mindset? Yeah. And at the end, it's really been tough because I mean, I would say the previous four years, I'm at South Alabama, we've been a top, you know, three, four team in the Sun Belt League. And, you know, we would hold people in the 50s. And there was a stretch two years ago where we had four straight games where we held people to below 55, and we lost all four games. And so, you know, we didn't have the defense. I'm looking at film, and all I'm saying is, man, could we get to stop here? Well, if we had to get in this position, we could have did this. And it's really, we need to score some more buckets. So as we've gone to this approach, the line has been, when do we stop play? We've got the great offense work, but the defense broke down maybe, or vice versa. And it's, when do you stop? But what we've decided so far is to let go and then come back and try to rehearse the play, recreate it. And um, so that's been difficult for me because the minute I see someone out of line, I want to stop it but I don't want to stop the offensive flow we've created as well. So still trying to balance that. Well, and you're going to do that for a long time, coach. I'm going to tell you, <laughs> it, it's hard, especially as you go through the season. And, you know, especially say as you move towards the latter half of your season, like the tendency is certainly that you practice shorter because you're playing more games and, mm-hmm. you know, you have a game within two days usually or something like that. Yeah. So that, you know, you want to stop it even less. And that's hard because you do – as a coach, you still always see every mistake. It's just a question of what you want to attune your players to and what's beneficial to attune them to. So can you talk about how you do stop things within this, say, games approach within practice, whether it's 3-on-3, 4-on-4, 5-on-5? How do you st- – within practice, whether it's 3-on-3, 4-on-4, 5-on-5, how do you stop them and how do you teach them within this now? Okay, yeah, and we'll just – like I'm a whistle guy, and that's a dumb hard thing because that's the only thing that stops play yep. in games. And, you know, I know a lot of people, they want the players to recognize their voice, and I haven't been able to adapt to that. So, but, you know, we just blow the whistle, and we just try to stop it. Let's go. Let's line them back up. Get back where you were. Here we go. All right. And, hey, what did you see here? You know, and it starts with asking questions, and that hasn't been great for me. That's something I'm trying to improve on. And so now we try to recreate the situation and try to, hey, here's the option. Here's what we'd like to do. We'd rather let this player take the shot than that player. You know, try not to give them A and B because you start giving a lot of choices, then they, you know, they kind of choose like to do and get back from there. But that's the main thing is really just stop it, try to recreate it. And then we may try to come back and recreate it at full speed to see if we can make an adjustment. That's difficult because every play is a life of its own and it's something different. One player just makes one subtle move, a different play, and it's a different action or a different result. Well, and that's great. I mean, that's the basics of all this is just stop it, recreate the situation, coach the situation, and then either continue from the situation or just continue on, you know, wherever you might want to start again. But yeah, it's, it's great. And so you find uh, with the questioning and answering that your players are being engaged, 
you're getting them to answer questions generally? Yeah, they ask a question. You know, you got some that are more talkative than others, but they will. And I think one of the things also that really trying to do and have not done a great job, but it's definitely something I want to work on, you know, shot selection versus saying to a kid, that's a bad, that's a bad shot. We don't want you taking that shot or whatever. I, I heard someone that say, hey, ask that player how they feel about that shot. And that's something. I, <laughs> you you mean ask one of their teammates or ask them? No, <laughs> ask them. The actual yeah. shooter, you know. Yeah. And so it may be one of those things where I may not say it out loud, but off to the side, hey, how do you feel about that shot? And it, because ultimately it comes down to, you know, to that. I, well, I just, I thought this or I thought that and, Okay, but but how did you feel? And and is that a shot we work on? Is that a shot you work on? So versus uh, we don't need you taking that. That's a bad shot because I need players when they're open to, to have confidence that we believe in them, that they can make that shot and do it. And that's just through the hard work and the repetitions as well. So that's the thing we kind of – I try to go to a little bit. Now, how you feel about that shot? I love that, Coach, because – and you even said something deeper there with Court – is that there's so many of these moments within this game's approach that within the flow of the play, you may let it go, but you can always connect with players in these mini conversations off the court that gets them to think deeper or gets them to, or for you, you can notice their progress or their success or their needs improvement. And I love mini conversations. I just think that's such a big part of your culture and, and having those conversations that your players can listen, provide input and be empowered and be player led. So that's great. And has that always been a part of your philosophy? You know what? Pretty much. I really try not to front kids in front of the team. I mean, I, and I think, you know, players are different today a lot. And so try to just kind of, hey, you know, what do you think about that? I think you need to pass this or whatever. Because I've seen kids when I have said something out in front of them and you just see them go on a shell. And that doesn't help anyone. So, you know. You can't disconnect ego from the player, right? No from the player, right? No matter what, even the humblest player in the world has ego when it comes to you correcting them in front of their peers, in front of other people. So that's such an interesting thing, but it's a fine line because as a coach, you want to get right to the point and move on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, you always say all the time, Hey, don't listen to how I'm saying it. Listen to what I'm saying or or just just all those kind of things. Well, I think we're in different times now. And so you got to have a, a relationship with the kids, first of all. But then the second thing is, hey, let, put your arm around the shoulder and say, hey, all right, how'd you feel about that? And let's, you know, this is what we need. And, and have that conversation. And, okay. Coach, I think we could do a whole podcast on some of your expressions. I love that. Can you say that one again about the hound? Uh, I just said, put your hand on the shoulder and just kind of go, hey, you know, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So. <laughs> no, it was something else. I'll go back and replay it. But that was great. Yeah, it's awesome. Coach, so BDT. So have you you dove into a little bit of the BDT shooting or is it just generally just more emphasis on decision training within practice and within things? Yeah, more in practice right now. But in the off season, I'm looking forward to, you know, when you got the one-on-one where it's a coach and a player, and, you know, you just shoot. Now, we will do some of the dancing with the footwork yep. and those types of things, but really it's about, hey, pass, hands down, shot, because it really does come down to the decision. You can tell them, hey, catch and shoot this, or let's, hey, shot fake, and it's all imagination where they're not. But now I'm playing with my head up, my eyes up, and I actually see the cue that tells me what to do, which is what the defense does. And so I'm so looking forward to that in spring with our players to do that and then, you know, add where they can do it with each other and get some workouts in where where it's two on, you know, where they're working one-on-one, but it's them not with a coach. So I'm really looking forward to that part of it because it is. The more you can play with your head up, the better you are. Well, we try to tell our players, and we tell this in camp, you don't have to be – you don't have to have, be able to lift more weights, run more sprints, do more things, be a great athlete. But if you can make better decisions, you can become a better basketball player. It's a really easy way, in a sense, to improve in a much bigger way than I think even skill development. Because, again, making the right decision about when to shoot, when to drive, when to pass has almost a more – 
important impact than actually the skill of doing those things because you're going to do it now with a better opportunity or do it when you have a better opportunity. So that's great. And I'm excited for you because, I mean, you talked, the other part you talked about is getting into small group workouts. And I think that's another thing is that I think, and I think that's another thing is that I think too often we misconstrue player development as individual, whereas player development is much more impactful in my opinion when you can do it within small group workouts so that you do incorporate the decision in some way, whether it's simulated through BDT shooting or it's simulated through, or it's live through offense versus mm-hmm. defense. So I'm looking forward to that. Now, what do your rules allow? How many players are you allowed in a small group workout? We can have four, but now the rules kind of change. You can have the whole team if you want. You just split them up and do it just from a facility standpoint, trying to get them all in. So before is the max it, when you can't have the whole team in. So, yeah. yeah, and again, I'm not saying there's no – like do some isolated skill development, different things like that. But but by and large, your players can make huge growth just by playing offense versus defense in the offseason. No doubt. And I'll take it to this step right here. When I was at Spring Hill College – in AI school, we could to this step right here. When I was at Spring Hill College in AI school, we could basically do anything. So I was doing some private lessons. And, you know, but parents, well, I just want one on one. Well, there's only so much we can do, me and the player. You know, let's get to some groups, you know, let's get to where it's four people and we can go two on two. And the kid will learn more from that than one-on-one, one-on-o, basically. And so it is. It's being able to play two-on-two. It's playing one-on-one. You know, I heard Sherry Cole on one of your um, podcasts talking about playing one-on-one. And that's something, you know, I think kids don't play one-on-one anymore. <laughs> so, well, and that's yeah. because this training has become, as you said, it's become one-on-o. Because yeah. that's what, oh, my kid's getting all the attention or the player's getting all the attention and they're getting focused development. But really, again, I think – as you just said, they're not getting as much development as they would if they are playing offense versus defense in some context. And mm-hmm. that's where real true development happens and where we've probably lost out a little bit in the offseason. So it's great that you have that opportunity to do that with your players this season. Yeah, and it is just really looking to try to, to teach and really for them to learn. And that's the most important thing is for them to learn and then they can take it to the next step and it's about teaching the game and understanding the game and anytime you're on air it's just not real so looking forward to the off season and like I said being able to do those things with us and you know reading screens and all those types of things and doing it in live action no it's really cool it's really cool to hear you talk about this a little bit and coach are there any other uh, insights to this type of switch that you can share with coaches about moving from, say, traditional block drills, on-air drills. And years. And again, there's nothing wrong with mixing it in, but it has allowed for our players to have more freedom, which is tough for a coach now. I mean, they, our players have a lot of freedom in our practices, but it's carried over to us being able to do some things in games. And, and it's funny because the other day we were in a game and something happens, and I just kind of put my head down and the bench is just dying because they know it's killing me, you know. <laughs> it's just killing me, you know. You lose some of the control that you want as a coach. And you don't have that control on game day. So you might as well practice it and practice And that's what's happened to me. It's allowed me to be a little more free on game day as well. And By free, you mean relaxed? What do you mean by free? Well, I just mean, you're talking about for me. So for yeah, me, for you, I'm, like you kind of indicated that you're a little bit more free on game. Well, I just mean, you're talking about for me. So for yeah, me, for so you, I'm, like you kind of indicated that you're a little bit more free on game day. What do you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. I've, you know, I've seen it in practice. I feel like we've somewhat, we are more prepared than we had because I was stopping everything and doing it. And I can't stop it on game day. So it's just allowed me to be more freer and let those things happen. Just let the game happen. That's incredibly insightful, Coach. Thanks for sharing that because you do think that's a byproduct for sure. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. And part of that for me also is this. Because we're playing with more possessions, our team doesn't have to be as perfect. 
before we had to be, I mean, we needed to score. We needed to stop because we were playing with fewer possessions. You know, we were milking the shot clock down to scoring under red and team because we were trying to take away offensive possessions from the other team and eight seconds of the shot clock. And so everything was more intense. Every possession was critical. Now there's so much flow into the game. You know, we're getting about an extra 20, 22 possessions a game. There is a little more room margin for error, but there's also a lot more opportunities to score and make up for those. And so yeah. it's allowed me to say, okay, that's, a little more that's, that's great. Relaxed. Yeah. Well, fun for you and your players. Yes, uh, the players love it. I'm telling you, I, and I tell them that I said, "You guys, it's driving me crazy," and they know it, you know. And they're like, "Oh, coach, it's gonna be all right," you know. And so, um, but they like playing, you know. And so, if we can accomplish what we need to accomplish, them enjoying the game, me being able to coach them, and then everything Does this changed your practice planning. It's changed it from a standpoint of, like I said, we dive right into it. And we don't go as long. You know, we're probably going an hour 45, hour and a half. And then, you know, we may have some extra shooting at the end and do some things to get up to two hours. But from a standpoint of doing things on the floor, it's made practices shorter. We've taken our combination of, you know, we know we're getting offensive defense taken care of in this and we're going to coach both sides of the ball in these segments. So we're not as focused on offense, defense. This is it. You don't see our practice go from defense to offense like it used to. And it's all mixed together. Transition, which now we're working on transition, offense, defense to half court to full court. That's what you will see, but there's, I don't think you see a specific breakdown right now. The other thing, Coach, I think you can help people with is you've already mentioned this a number of times, and I want coaches to know this is not easy. It is hard, and that's okay. Like, that's part of any change. It's not just related to basketball, but are there any any advice that you can give to a coach that's maybe considering a change a little bit from, you know, traditional block drills, on-air drills to more of a games approach to coaching? What are some insights or advice you can give them in that process? Because I'm sure you had second thoughts when you first went to it. Yeah, you know, in the words of Nick Saban, it's trust the process. But the thing about it is what I found is, again, it's allowed me to do both. It's allowed us to to coach offense and defense at the same time. It has our players enjoy it. Again, that's half the battle in practice. And, you know, you don't want your players to, you know, always enjoy everything. I'm not saying we don't do hard things, but but they always enjoy everything. I'm not saying we don't do hard things, but, but they come out and they play. And I would say just it's an easier way to teach to me as well because it's allowed our players to read and react to the game versus us dictate the entire practice, how things need to be done. And so They've seen it. All right, what should you do in this? And they see it so many times because of the live play that you do that it almost sometimes teaches itself once you give them what you want out of that particular situation. Well, it's wonderful stuff. And I really appreciate you taking some time, Coach Fowler, and sharing with us. And uh, I wish you all the best as you go through this year and the process. And I know you're very open. You're on social media, so Coach can reach out to you as well and uh, talk to you about this after the season. So I know you'll be a great sharer of this as well. So thanks for connecting with us and sharing the game, Coach. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And I, Coach. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And I, I appreciate everything you do. I enjoy all your podcasts. And, and I've learned so much from following you on social media and being a member of Basketball Immersion. And I can't thank you enough for for what you've done and kind of opened my eyes up to this um, games approach as well. Well, I'm humbled and honored by that, Coach. So thank you. And all the best as you go through the season. Thank you. And to this week's episode, to let you know what you're missing, if you are not currently a member of BasketballImmersion.com. Basketball Immersion is one-stop shopping for video learning to stimulate your basketball coaching using evidence-based practices. 
Watch hundreds of videos covering BDT shooting, zero second skill training, how we teach using small sided games and a games approach to coaching, as well as team concepts and systems like trail trap, flow offense, two sided fast break, and much, much more. NCAA, NBA, pro, high school, and youth coaches are amongst the thousands of coaches who are a part of our community. Go to basketballimmersion.com today to stimulate your basketball coaching.